All righty, welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoy your coffee break. I did. Um, right, so this is basically where we uh, took off from. So we stopped here in the slides, and then we had, um, implemented our supervised learning pipeline. And this is exactly what we did. We built this uh, supervised setup with a neural network or in combination with a neural network to predict climate zone classes from Sentinel-2 imaging data. So you could think this is a solved problem because we can solve this part and we can solve that part easily with tools that are nowadays available, um, namely with PyTorch or if you want to use TensorFlow, it doesn't really matter. Um, it really is a solved problem. But there's one issue, and that's actually the, the, the core of what I'm going to present here. And that is that <clears throat> this, this supervised approach assumes that you have training data available. Training data meaning mostly um, annotations. So the av availability of these annotations is actually the bottleneck in the supervised learning scenario. And this is a big problem. Um, who has ever labeled satellite imagery for some task? Was it fun? It was fun for a while, but it was a lot of work, right? And yeah, so you have lots of issues. So if, if you want to label things that are a couple of meters across and you have 10 meter resolution, for instance, in Sentinel-2, it's no fun. It's, it's hard work, it's difficult, it's really expensive. And that is one issue that we're dealing with in remote sensing maybe more than in other areas of computer vision because there it's easy, or sometimes it, for some applications it might be easy to get those annotations or labels. But in remote sensing it's really hard work and it might require experts to get those labels. So, more here than in other areas, um, we should ask ourselves how can we make more efficient use of those annotations that we have? And we might ask ourselves, can we take advantage of those vast amounts of unannotated data that we have? So for instance, if you look at the Sentinel-2 archive, it's been around for a couple of years now, there's terabytes and petabytes of data of Sentinel-2 available, can we use and we leverage that data somehow. This is what the remainder of this presentation will be about. <clears throat> so there's different methods how you can use labels more efficiently. Here, right now, I will just skim over them and then later, bit by bit, we go through them in, in more detail. So the, the easiest way to use your um, annotations more efficiently is to use data augmentations. So typically what you have is you have your data sample, your input image, you run that through your network, your backbone, for some specific task to, to answer some specific problem. Um, what you can do is you can augment your data. So data augmentation really means that you take your sample as it is and you modify it. For instance, you can turn it by 90 degrees. You can flip it upside down, right? The data is the same, and more importantly, the label is the same. You know the uh, transformation that you apply here, so you know whether the label might change. I mean, the label might be a segmentation mask here, but if you flip this image, the segmentation mask flips too, so you have a label for free. So this way you can synthetically increase the size of your training data set. Another way is to use data fusion. We not only have imaging data available, we have um, SAR data available, we have all kinds of data available. So we might take advantage of those and combine them with each other, right? This is called data fusion. You take different data modalities, you fuse them together, run it through a model to um, solve your task. You can do multitask learning. Um, this might sound a little bit weird to those not really familiar with, with deep learning. Um, instead of, let's assume you're only interested in task B, which might be regression or something, some regression task. So instead of only training your model to solve this task B, you could set up your model in such a way that it learns two other tasks 
based on the same data for free at the same time. What happens is that your model will learn richer information, more important information, by learning those additional tasks. And this might be beneficial for your task B2. We'll look into that in a bit. There's transfer learning. Um, this is what you're interested in. But what you could do is you can take the same model and train it on a different data set and on a different task. Why? Well, why not? Because the model here learns, um, learns to extract information from this data here that might be useful for this other task as well. So once you train your model on this other task, you can take it here, put it in your, the actual thing that you're interested in, the actual task, and instead of training your model from scratch here, you can use this pre-trained model. This is called transfer learning. So you transfer the knowledge that you learned here to there. Those might be different tasks. But in the end, what happens in the first couple layers, if, if this is a convolutional style neural network, the model will simply learn to see, right? It will learn to extract information from the image. And then it doesn't really matter if this is of these two tasks are regression tasks or classification or segmentation or whatever. It, it doesn't matter. So you don't start from scratch your training process, but from a pre-trained model. And therefore, you get some, some uh, performance benefits from that. So that brings us to the question, can we maybe pre-train our model on unannotated data? So you still need labels here, right? Can we use data without labels? And that brings us to self-supervised learning, which is more or less the same thing, but you use a pretext task. Pretext task is a task that does not require human labeled data, but instead it uses some pretexts, right? It, it, it comes up with pseudo labels, they are sometimes called. And you can use those pseudo labels to train this backbone here. And then you can use that in your, um, <clears throat> in the actual task that you're interested in, OK? So the, those are a lot of things. And we will look at those in the following now, right? For some of them, not for the data augmentations, but for the others, we'll also go through the code, how you can implement it. Data augmentations are kind of simple. It's really not that difficult to implement them, so I, I skipped that here but you find code online and there's packages, uh, modules that do that for you. Uh, yeah, not after the coffee break, but no. Okay, data augmentations. So data augmentations, as I said, they kind of synth synthetically increase the size of your data set. Synthetically because they don't generate new data, but they change the data in such a way that to the computer it might look like a different data point, it might look like a different sample, but as a human, if you have some, some the ability to generalize, you, you might look at two images and just say, well, it's the same thing, it's just mirrored, right? But for a computer, that's a big feat to, to come up with something like that, with that information. So you can increase the size of your data set uh, through transformations. It's really just image transformations. Mirroring, flipping, rotations, I have a few examples in, in, in a minute. And these transformations in general do not change the corresponding labels. So we get to the labels for these synthetic images for free. That's the cool thing. That's why we're doing it. And as a result, if you use data augmentations, the model that you tend to, uh, or th that results from, from um, a data set that has been augmented, it, typically the results are more robust and less prone to overfitting, simply because you enable or you, you provide the means to the model to generalize better because it gets different views of the same data. And therefore, it can be, it may be more resilient, you could even say, right? So the idea is you have your data set, you apply data augmentations, and you increase the data set size. It could be by a factor of many, actually. So this is the original data and then the augmented data. So data augmentations have been around for a while. In computer vision, for instance, if this is our original image, um, what we can do or what has been done, image flipping, 
super easy. Image enhancements, you can play with the contrast, brightness, some image, global image properties, you can change those. You can apply color distortions, so it's a little bit greenish, the kitty, yeah, it's easy to see there. Um, those are pretty common, or you can crop the image, right? So just take part of the image, not the entire image. Other things are image blocking, so you could put a black bar um, across the image. There's unlimited variations of that. And they are uh, used um, on a regular basis. I mean, those are really standard transformations. So we can use the same transformations, the same augmentations on remote sensing data. Oops. So this, if this is our original image, what we can do is we can flip it from left to right. We can use the same image enhancements. We can play with contrast a little bit. Um, you can do color distortions, and you can crop uh, parts of the image. Question for you, are those all good uh, transformations for remote sensing data? Which one is not a good choice? The color distortion is not a good choice. And it's not a good choice because it changes the spectral properties. I mean, we're, we're not dealing with dog and cat images here. We do care about spectral information. I mean, we, we spend a lot of money, not us, but people spend a lot of money to send those satellites into space to get spectrally resolved information of the surface. Now, if we apply those color distortions, we kind of, right, doesn't make sense. So, you have to be careful. Not all of those transformations are useful because this will destroy some information. But on the other hand, it might be beneficial if you, if you don't care about spectral information, but about, um, uh, let's say, only the, the shape of things on the ground, some, some surface features. Um, wow, there's an echo. <laughs> um, this might actually help. Hello, hello. It's better. Thank you. OK, so this might actually beneficial, be beneficial for that. But you have to be very careful in specific cases. Another thing is, now it's back. So another thing, um, let's have a look at this kitty here. So we flipped it from left to right. Sounds good, right? Would it be appropriate to flip this image upside down? There are images of cats upside down, but there's a very limited amount of those, right? Most likely, if you have a picture of a cat and you want to train a model to identify cats, um, it will be upright. It will not be upside down. So training a model on cat images that are upside down might not be a good idea, right? So that might be harmful for the model unless you're looking at bats or something. Um, right, so this, for cat images, that would be kind of inappropriate. But for remote sensing images, we don't care. There's absolutely no preference direction, right? So we have additional degrees of freedom. We lose kind of the color distortions, but we get additional degrees of freedom here because we can flip upside down and we can rotate in any direction basically by 90 degrees or even by any other angle, right? So this is something to keep in mind. This is one thing that is kind of specific to remote sensing data, or at least, let's say, multispectral imaging data. For SAR, it's different, because there you have a direction of preference in your data from the flight direction, the orbital path of your satellite. But I, I had a discussion with people whether it still might be useful to even flip those images, because you destroy some of the information. But again, this might help to make your model more robust. So it's it's. It's really on a case-to-case -case basis whether specific transformations make sense or not. 
Okay, um, to sum this up, there are powerful method uh, data augmentations, but you have to use them with some care. You have to think about what the consequences are of using specific augmentations. I can't think of a single reason why not to use those augmentations if you use them properly, right? Think about it, but I can't come up with a reason why not to use them. They're cheap, they're easy to use. Um, right, and we'll leave it at that, okay? There's modules out there you can really easy build your own code to, to apply those transformations. And um, that's pretty much it, okay? To, uh, for, for the data augmentations. Any questions on data augmentations? Let's see if there is one. There is one. I want to ask about color enhancements. Is it as, okay, I, should, I, I want to ask about color enhancements. Is it also not harmful? The augmentation using color enhancement, yeah. is it um, not harmful? It depends. It depends on, on how strong those um, okay. augmentations are. Um, even the, the color distortions, they can be fine if it's within a very limited amount uh, or, or if it, it changes the spectral information within a range that is naturally it, that occurs naturally, right? But then um, the question is, does it then even make sense? It's, it's, it's difficult. Um, yeah, those enhancements, like changing the contrast. I mean... Maybe I can think of it being dependent on the task. If you want to only do segmentation, you know, we only care about the shape. So modifying yeah. color might not be that helpful. Maybe. Maybe, but I mean, for, for, for satellite data, the, the thing is that um, the, uh, the image quality stays the same, right? There is no sharper images or, or I mean, you can have uh, reduced image sharpness, I would say, if, if there's fog on the ground or high uh, humidity in, in the air. But it's, I think that's something that, that one would have to look into, what is really, what occurs in nature, and can we simulate these processes to, to augment our data with them? Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. So, would it hurt if we use some band combinations, such NDVI, as an uh, augmentation technique? Would, would it hurt if we do, we do so? Well, I think it depends on what the task is that you're interested in. Using NDVI is always a good option, I would think. And, and I mean, you, you could um, even augment, you could augment NDVI, for instance, by adding some noise. That might be a good choice um, because it's kind of the, the, the spectral information has already been taken out. Um, it might be more difficult if you were to apply something like Gaussian noise to the original bands and then um, calculate or compute NDVI from that. That might change the, um, the information. Any other questions? If not, we move on. Yep. So, can you suggest some data augmentation techniques for synthetic aperture radar? I'm not a big expert in SAR, um, but I do know about those, um, the limitation that you can't do mirroring flipping. You have to be really careful about that. Um, I think what is pretty common there is to use Gaussian noise because the images in itself seem or look like they have a lot of noise in them. Um, what, you, what I also have seen is like adding um, like synthetic speckles um, to the data. You can do that to some extent. <laughs> exactly, the pre-processing of SAR data, the speckle noise and any type of yeah. this type of noise. Yeah, right, but exactly. So the input data is not changed. Yeah. All in all. So whatever the natural occurring noises are, you can play with those. Yeah.
Shall we move on? Excellent. Thank you. All right, let's move on to data fusion. So data fusion. Um, so in data fusion, you use different data modalities, modalities and you combine them in your model. And you can do that at different stages. Um, the goal is that the model that uses fused data has a better performance, therefore being more efficient because you, in the end you need less data if you use more data modalities. And the data modalities that you use or that you should use depends on your task. And the data should be, um, what's the word? They, um, they should be complementary, right? They should contain different information. If you use the same, well, let's put it this way. You, you can't use different Sentinel-2 bands as different data modalities because they may mostly show the same information just at a different spectral regime, right? Or might be a slightly different spectral regime. But for instance, if you combine Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1, it's completely different physical phenomena that you capture in your data, and that might be a useful combination, okay? So Earth observation is kind of predestined for uh, data fusion, and it has been used for a long while already, even before uh, deep learning really came up. And that's simply because um, in Earth observation, we have so many different sensors. We have satellites, we have planes, we have drones. They use different sensors. They capture different information. And every sensor or, yeah, every method captures different information on the scene that you're looking at, right? So um, it makes sense to look at different data modalities here. Just to give you some example, we have multispectral data, for instance, from Sentinel-2 or Landsat. We have SAR data from Sentinel-1, ISI. There's digital elevation models, for instance, here for the Copernicus DEM. We have different types of land use, land cover classification schemas. Uh, Korean or wall cover are pretty common. And there's much more stuff that I would call simply metadata. Um, or you could call it scalar data. So those are not like map-like information on a scene, but simply um, global information on the scene. So that, for instance, what is the, what were the weather conditions at the time of observation? Um, what are other observation circumstances? Maybe even circumstances about, um, let's say, um, the satellite that took the data. What were the properties of the satellite? If that affects the data, there's a lot of stuff. One more note, uh, Paolo Gamba will present um, on this, on, on data, sorry, data fusion for change detection in urban areas tomorrow. So he will also introduce some of the concepts that I'm showing you here right now. Right, so now we talk about the data set. I promised this a while ago. So this is the data set that we compiled for iGARS. We presented it there for the tutorial. And this is the same data set that we're using here for this tutorial. So um, the idea is to have a data set that basically we can play around with. Um, so at our chair at the University of St. Gallen, we're mostly machine learning people, not so much uh, remote sensing people. So what machine learning people want is like a predefined data set. Here it is. Go out, try it out, do stuff with it, right? Um, people are not really as interested in the technical specificalities of, of different data sets. So we wanted to compile a data set that is truly multimodal, because this is, um, I think, kind of unique in computer vision that we have so many data modalities in remote sensing. And we want to combine that into one data set so that we can play with different data fusion concepts, but, as, but also pre-training concepts like self-supervised learning. Right, so here are some examples, different patches. We have Sentinel-2, um, we have elevation model, we have land use, land cover information, climate zone, um, season, which is a number between zero and one, zero being winter, one being summer, 
and the temperature at the time, the surface temperature at this, sorry, not the surface, but the ambient air temperature at the time of observation. And why those modalities? Because they were available, right? You could extend this list. If you have some cool ideas, we can extend this list and add more data modalities. It's really just compile what is out there, what is freely available for any point on this planet. That's important, so that people can play with this data set here, figure out, okay, this works nice for my application. Now I want to add those different data modalities for my data set, which might not be Sentinel-2, but it might be aerial imaging or something like that, right? So um, the data set is based on Big EarthNet, that contains 590,326 patches of co-located Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. It's called Big EarthNet, but it, it's actually focusing on Europe. It's a little bit of misleading, I would say. Anyway, so we extend Big EarthNet by adding some data modalities, and that's pretty much what I just uh, mentioned, elevation data, land use, land cover maps, environmental data, so that's weather data from era five, that's a climate model. Uh, climate zone classification, so that's a Beck et al. paper you were asking about, uh, and the seasonal encoding. Right, and the idea is simply to have this as a test bed, so that everybody can play with this. It's 590,000 patches, it's a lot of data, it's forgot 200, 300 gigabytes if you download it and unpack it. We can't deal with that on Colab, therefore we only use 800 patches from there, okay? If you're interested in this data set, you can find it here um, or just Google, right? And we're using the tiny little brother of that. Okay, so what are the modalities in there? We have Sentinel-2, multispectral, level 2A, um, Sentinel-1 SAR. So this is actually what was already in Big EarthNet. And we extended it by adding um, the DEM data, land use, land cover, and some metadata. So these are all the map-like uh, features. They're all at 10 meter resolution. And this here is basically global data for each patch. Okay, so we talked about data, we talked about uh, data fusion a little bit. How can we use data fusion in deep learning? I told you so far that we combine the data somehow, but how do we do that? And this is, um, uh, yeah, basically we'll talk about this in the next couple of minutes. I will show you the code. It's really simple. So just to um, remind you about the default supervised learning setup, we have our data. The data goes through a backbone. So we talked about this before. Um, the backbone is basically it acts as a feature extractor. It learns to extract useful features from the data ends up with a representation, and that representation goes through a head that's a small network, and um, from the head, uh, or the head actually does the prediction um, for uh, whatever the, the target may be. And based on the learned representation, so for instance, a classification head trained on power plants will tell you, is there a power plant or is there no power plant? And that's the output, basically. The output could be just a label, it could be a number, it could be a full segmentation map, whatever you want, right? It really depends on how does this backbone look like, how does this head look like? Okay, so there's two important concepts that I will mention here, there's variations of it, but basically the two important ones are early fusion and late fusion. So, they allow you to merge or combine different data modalities at different stages in this process here. So early fusion might be the easiest one. So in early fusion, two or more data modalities are combined before they enter the backbone. So we have data source one, data source two. Those are different data modalities, right? Like Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1. And what you do is you combine them 
functions, for instance, by concatenating them. So this is pretty common, to simply concatenate the two data modalities, you stack them along the channel axis. So let's say you have 12 Sentinel-2 channels, you have two Sentinel-1 uh, channels, and you simply stack them to an array of 14 channels, which makes sense because they cover the same area, they have the same resolution, so that is important. The modalities, they have to have the same shape, that, you, that the information in one pixel um, is across all the channels valid, right? So you stack the data, and that's something that even a human does understand. It's like a catalog of data. You simply extend the catalog by adding more channels. So you con can concatenate those modalities, and then you use the same pipeline. You send it through the backbone, through the head, you get your output, right? Kind of easy, kind of a natural thing to do. You combine them, and then you send it through your model. So now the model will hopefully be able to use that additional data modality to combine them in a meaningful way. But it's not guaranteed, right? It's never guaranteed that it works. In theory, this sounds like a good idea, and in most cases it is, but it's not guaranteed that it always works. Um, one issue we might, or we have to mention here is that um, this is really simple for Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data because they have the same resolution, they have the same shape, right? But what if we were to combine map-like features with like a scalar information like the temperature or the season, right? The season data that we have. So here's the example. Sentinel-2 data, 12 channels, 120 by 120 pixels with patch global seasonality, any value between zero and one. How do we combine those? doesn't really make sense because one is a number and one is a 12, uh, 12 channel 120 by 120 pixel array. So this is complicated. And an easy solution here is that you take the 12 channels, you want to combine the two. The easy solution is to simply add another patch of the same size as the Sentinel-2 channels and fill it up with 0.65 at every single pixel. This is called a blow-up patch, and it's, it's, it's like a wood, hum, wood hammer method. It, it works, it's not nice, it's not beautiful, but it works, it does the trick, right? Because the value of 0.65 is the same at every location in this image, so let's just assign the value of 0.65 to every single pixel. It works. Right. Um, so there's that, and then we have late fusion. So late fusion, um, here you have two or more data modalities that are combined after passing through separate backbones. It's uh, sometimes considered more machine learning-y um, because it's, it uses the data separately, the two data modalities, and then combines the information. So here we have our first data modality, which has its own backbone. And we have a second data modality with its own backbone. And the representations, right, so they, they, these backbones, they might be either completely separate or they could have some shared weights. Depends on what you want to do. In most cases, I would say, you simply <coughs> assume them to be completely separate from each other. So now, backbone one and two, they have their representations that come out. You concatenate them again in any way that you want. That's a nice thing here because it doesn't matter. It's some n-dimensional representation. It doesn't matter how I put them together. I just, you just have to do it consistently, right? Don't change it because then it's, the model gets confused. So you, con con yeah. you concatenate the two, you send it through your head, and you get your output, right? Um, and that's pretty much it. If it. The question for now is, can we do it later? Yeah. Okay, then write it down. Okay, so, um, let me tell you now already that late fusion sometimes is 
more successful than early fusion. It gives you a little bit more performance. But one thing to keep in mind is if you do late fusion, you have a separate backbone for each data modality. So if you were to use our unit as a backbone in early fusion, and you use the same unit in late fusion, um, your late fusion model will have twice the number of parameters. Just something to keep in mind. Late fusion seems to work better, but maybe it only works better because we have a model twice the size, right? We'll, we'll talk about that again later. Okay, so time for coding. So we will implement early fusion and late fusion in the architecture that we built before. Okay? And you will see it's really easy. It's really not that difficult. Okay, so as you see here, uh, I was re uh, disconnected, which is fine. You can simply reconnect, and then everything should be there again. So you see here, it takes a little bit. Here, now I'm back. Okay, so here again, for your reference, uh, early fusion. We'll start with early fusion. Uh, what we will do is um, we'll simply fuse Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, right? So we have Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2. We have the same backbone that we had before, and then we have our output. So what do we have to change? There's two things we have to do. First, we have to change the number of the input channels of our architecture. So let me go back real quick. We define our architecture here. Classification unit, and here we had n channels and n classes. So the number of classes is the same because we have the same goal of predicting climate zones. But the number of channels changed. We had 12 channels in Sentinel-2. Now we have 14 because we have 12 from Sentinel-2 and two from Sentinel-1. Okay? So this is something we have to change. Uh, here it is. So for our early fusion model, EF, we changed the number of input channels to 14 and the number of classes stays at 12. And now we have to change that step function here. If you remember, we built our trainer class that does, care, does take care of the, the training and all the processes that are happening. So here in the training step, we defined our target, y. And then before, oh, let me show you here. Before it looked like this, y. And then data was simply Sentinel-2. So this is the input to our model for the old model that only used Sentinel-2, but now we want to provide a concatenation of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. Okay, so this is what we have to change. The input data to our model is now a concatenation of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. So we do that here. We simply build or create a new class. Um, blah. We call it Sentinel-1-2 Early Fusion Classification Unit Trainer. So you can make those names as long as you want in Python. That's useful. Um, so we define Sentinel-2 data here, and then Sentinel-1. And then we simply concatenate with TorchCat. We concatenate the two along dimension 1. Dimension 0 is the index of in your mini batch, dimension one of the channels, two is, I think, height, and three is, is um, width of your image. So we simply concatenate the two, and then it's the same, right? We simply run the concatenation of the two data modalities through the model. The model has been changed here to accept 14 ch channels. That's it. Right? So we can run this here. 
And then this is basically the same setup. I just changed the names here so that we can use the updated uh, trainer. And then we can train it. It runs, it takes a while. And the results here, so this is the, um, if we uh, evaluate it on the test data set, you will see that the, um, the accuracy that we receive is now 35%, and before it was 45%. So that's what I mentioned. This is a really small data set, so the, re the results that come out of this are not really represent representative. So um, when we're done with the coding part here, I will show you some results um, from our own research that show that actually there is a gain in using uh, data fusion techniques, but in this specific example, it, it does not help, and that's simply because the data set is so small. Okay, that was early fusion. Late fusion is just as simple. So what did we do there, or what do we have to do there? Data modality one has its own backbone. Data modality two has its own backbone. We set those backbones up. We concatenate the representations that come out of them. That goes through the head and then we get the output. So the changes we have to make here are a bit more architectural. So we build our um, late fusion classification unit. We build it separately, right? Because there are some more changes we have to do. So we simply define a backbone for Sentinel-1 here with two channels for Sentinel-1, a backbone for Sentinel-2 with 12 channels, and we define a head. That's the same head that we used before. And then we put it together in such a way that we have a representation coming out of the backbone one, a representation coming out of backbone two. We concatenate those two representations and we send it through the head. So this is exactly what this diagram here does, right? And because the way we implement those um, networks in PyTorch, it's super modular, right? You could, you could write this out by hand, it doesn't make sense, but you can define all those different elements here, like the separate backbones. This is really, I mean, one can read this, right? It's really not that hard. So that's pretty cool. Let's run this. And then it's the same thing again. We get an instance of this new model with 12 classes, right? Because the number of uh, input channels is fixed. And then this is the same stuff again. And it trains, and that's it. So this model is actually, because I, I told you that late fusion tends to work a little bit better, this is actually 1% better <laughs> than the other. It's, again, not representative. But to show you some representative numbers, let me go back. <laughs> to show you some representative numbers, so this is from our Benji paper where we had a master student um, really churning through those different data modalities for the tasks, for actually two tasks, there is um, classification on land use, land cover, um, top five classes, I think, and there is a segmentation on those land cover maps. And here on the left, you see the different data modalities that we used in training the models. So if we only use Sentinel-2, we get an F1 score for classification of 77%. Segmentation of 39%. That's pretty good. That's actually the best you can get with only a single modality. For Sentinel-1, it's a little bit worse. If you use the climate zone information, which is um, constants across the entire patch, this is actually, it's a little bit worse, but given that it's um, scalar information, it doesn't change across the patch, it's still pretty good. Right? 
the elevation model is next, weather information, and the season. So one good check is that season and, what was it, weather is completely useful for, sorry, is completely useless for the segmentation task. So that kind of makes sense. But what you see is if you combine two modalities, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, you outperform Sentinel-2 by quite a bit. Right? This is only using late fusion. We only focus on, on late fusion here. But you see that the, the, um, the gap is kind of nice. So there, there is actually a gap. So this is a good example. Then we also tried Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1, uh, sorry, season. Um, this was, I think, the worst combination of all of those. And it's um, still pretty good. I mean, it's still outperforming the single modality. And then if we use three modalities, you get even a bit more, right? We, we stopped there. We didn't combine all of them. Maybe we should have done that. But um, there's definitely a limit to how far you can go. And there is always the question, is it computationally useful to include all, this, all these different data modalities just to get another half percent out of it? But anyway, those combinations, they look pretty promising that um, you can use the data and the data set that we build in a, in a meaningful way. Right, but always keep in mind, these results depend really on the downstream tasks that you're interested in and um, the data, right? It might look different for different tasks and for different data. Always keep that in mind. And it's, in the end, this, this looks like, okay, the more data modalities, the better. But there's definitely a limit to this, and this limit depends on your task and on your data. So for your own research, you have to try it out. That's always what I tell everybody, give it a try. Give it a try on a tiny little data set and then see, does it work, does it help, and then you can spend more time on it. Right, which method is better? Early fusion, late fusion, we only use late fusion here. Um, it always looks better, but that might be a fallacy simply because um, you have more parameters. Your model is twice the size. If you use three modalities, your model is three times the size. More parameters, more capacity, typically translates into better performance in deep learning. Okay, questions on data fusion. Now is your chance. Uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. So I had uh, a quick question about uh, the late fusion. When we have two data modalities, even if we have uh, the same uh, two backbones. Because we have uh, two different modalities, we can have uh, two different feature distributions. So is it uh, relevant to normalize the extracted features first before con concatenating them, or uh, no? Because so if you have uh, maybe two different uh, feature distributions, we have, uh, we have features laying in different, uh, how can I say, ranges. Mm -hmm. So when we try to combine them, maybe there is a distribution that uh, overlays another one. So maybe so if we uh, try to normalize them before, like L1 or L2 normalization before concatenating them, does it make sense or no? So you normalize them before they go through the backbones? No, we extract them. We extract the features. Yeah. Then we normalize them. After that, we concatenate the features. Then we use the, the heat for classification, for example. I think I would normalize them before you send them through the backbones. Okay. Because just treat them like you, you all, you're only using that one data modality. I mean, if you were only to use a single data modality like Sentinel-1, you would normalize them in a Sentinel-1 way and then send them through the backbone, right? But if you have, for example, uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you mean like to, to weight them in different ways? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure of, uh, why you would normalize kind of, uh, them. Projecting them to the same uh, range, for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, it's like scaling, but. Uh, mm -hmm. um, 
You can try that. I'm not convinced. Yeah. Did, did you try with and no. without the normalizing? Uh, no. I mean, Th that was my, my question. Does it yeah. make sense to Does do it this kind sense? of stuff? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't expect a big effect from this because probably you will have uh, you have batch norm in your network, so that will mm. probably take care of the yeah, normalization. So, yeah, so I don't think that the the normalizations will be well. The scalings of the two representations will be too different. I yeah, think yeah, okay. they they will be similar, but um, in the end, the, the same rule applies. Give it a try. Yeah. Okay. You, yeah, but okay. but um, maybe I don't know. Might be small effects, but probably not big effects. I think it's more important to scale your data, normalize your data appropriately before you send it through the backbones, so that the uh, the backbones can take the full dynamic range of the data into account. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, when you uh, speak about the Sentinel-1, two bands. Is, mm -hmm. uh, in our image, we have phase and amplitude. It's OK. It's correct, uh, my imagination about this. And uh, um, how we can find and extract the feature uh, to improve our data and fusion the data, how mm -hmm. it can affect in our data set. It's phase and uh, amplitude. Mm -hmm. Another one is 12 bands of Sentinel-2. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't used the phase information. Um, I think, I mean, basically you have the phase information per pixel, right? Uh -huh. Just like the polarization. So just add it as an additional channel in, in Sentinel-2. So have the different polarization levels and the, uh, vertical, the vertical, vertical, yeah. horizontal, yeah. for example. Yeah. I think that would make sense. I'm not sure if there is a smarter way to do that. I use Sentinel-1 or Cosmos Sky Met SAR data, but mm -hmm. extraction after processing. Mm -hmm. In, for example, long short-term memory, LSTM, with, uh, after uh, extracting the cumulative deformation. I have mm -hmm. the deformation, and this is the uh, type of my feature. Mm -hmm. But now, in the image base, just we have pixel. In each pixel, we have phase and amplitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, some work we can, uh, with uh, multi-spectral images, we can do it with Sentinel-1 or Cosmos climate. Mm -hmm. With SAR, because the ascending, descending track after clip, after change, after any type of change, our deformation, our uh, data completely destroyed. Interesting. OK. That sounds like a weird case. Let's talk about that later in detail. Yeah. But that sounds like an interesting case. Maybe we can. Can, can we talk about it later? Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. A question in the same direction as the first question. Since we have batch norm layers anyway, does it really make a difference to normalize the data before making it go, making it go through the backbone? Mm -hmm. Do you know if it makes a difference, like if normalizing the raw data? Yeah. before making it go through the backbone, since we have anyway batch norm layers? I mean, normalizing the data is never a bad thing. It can only help. Um, I've, I've seen people using not unnormalized data, and it works fine. In most cases, I think it will be fine. But in s you might trip into some pitfall, and then something is screwed up, and um, it might take a while to figure out that it might be due to the normalization. I mean, in, in, in Sentinel-2, for instance, um, we simply divide the counts by 10,000. That's enough normalization, just to bring it to a range that is much smaller yeah. and, 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 let's say, more well-behaved. The, the model okay. can deal with that easily. OK, thank you. So if we fuse the data set with a very different spatial resolution, as if Landsat, which is 30 meters, and Modi is 250. Uh, Modi's, which is 250 meters, which has low and high resolution, 
if we fuse such images, such bands together. So if uh, the accuracy is high, fusing, or is it possible to fuse? Because those data sets, Sentinel-1, 2, uh, these are SAR optical and has much similar spatial resolution. If mm -hmm. we try out different spatial resolution, so how does the outcome? So the question is how, how, how I would deal with high resolution imaging data sets. Oh. Because for Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, they're co-aligned, right? So th it's obvious here they can simply stack them on top of each other. So for high resolution imaging, there's more effects. You have different perspectives, different views, different locations of the observer, things like that. Um, I think in, in this case, something like early fusion would not work because you have to have the exact same pointing angle resolution and everything, so that's super complicated. But I have seen works where people use late fusion on that. If you have the same scene, you look at the same location from different angles, um, the model might be able to learn something from the representations, right? I mean, so the information is encoded in that representation you get out of the backbone, and then they work like, yeah, they are features in the end, something like those key points that were used in SIFT, for instance. Um, there are commonalities if it's the same scene, if, if the model learns something useful. So I think in that case, um, if you have changes in resolution in, in camera properties, late fusion would be the way to go, because that might be able to deal with it that. It should overlay over each other properly, the images. No, not, not early fusion puts them on top of each other. Late fusion, you have different, the different backbones, because then each backbone can extract some information, and you can combine that later. Okay. That might be the safest way. Question. Uh, when we are using metadata, so we are giving us a gridded product, or like uh, we need to, we are giving us a scalar. Okay. So we are giving us a scalar data, or like uh, we are giving us a vector data. Metadata we are giving with the parameters or something, mm -hmm. temperature. So how we are giving to that? With vector data? Yeah. Um, there's different ways. So you could, um, I have seen. Um, the easiest way to, would be to turn your vector data, if, if, you're, if you have map-like data and like a polygon. Mm -hmm. You could turn the polygon into a raster, Poly if it matches the, the same area. So that would be, um, if, if you have something like that. So for instance, you want to, um, you, you have information on some, some features in the image as in the form of vector data, you could turn it into, into a raster and then overlay it in early fusion. Um, I've seen some late fusion with vector data. I'm not 100% sure how that works. I'll have to look it up, but there's ways to deal with that. Yeah, like some pine feature is there, like how we can incorporate like rather than polygon. Again, okay. if you have pine data, Mm -hmm. So how can we incorporate into that, like, we have very coarse, uh, very limited point data, but if area of interest is very large when we are using raster data. Mm -hmm. So how it going to impact our results? Not sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe we discuss that later. Yeah, sure. That's a good case for later. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you. And one more, sorry. So when we are using a different uh, combination of bands, mm -hmm. so is any particular combination band best for this modality? Like we are going to use all the 12 bands of Sentinel, mm -hmm. or we are going to choose a particular bands based on our application. Mm -hmm. So which one, and based on application we need to change, or like we are doing, we are going with the uh, orally. How we are going, like uh, in if this case. you only case. want to use specific bands. Yeah. I mean, you, you simply, here we have our 12 channels. You simply get rid of those you don't want. Mm -hmm. So what we oftentimes do is only keep the 10 meter channels. So it's channel uh, or band one, two, no, two, three, four, RGB, and then the infrared, the 10 meter ones. And then it's only four channels in your tensor that you put into your model. Okay. So you can really select whatever combination you want in any order that you want. The order doesn't matter to the model as long as you stick to it. Don't change the order, like train your model on two, three, four, and then change it later to three, 
uh, two, one, whatever, and then that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Question? Thanks a lot for your presentation. I have a small technical question. But is there any reason that you prefer gradient descent over atom optimization in your project? Or? It's just an example. I would use atom. Yeah. Great, thanks. I think students build most of this. And for whatever reason, they use SGD. <laughs> any other question? If not, we move on to multitask learning. So multitask learning is super simple. Um, and even the, the coding part is really simple. Um, so you want to typically what you want to do is you want to solve one specific task. You have one downstream task that you want your model to learn. Um, so you can do that. Um, another thing you can do is you can learn several tasks at the same time. That's basically what multitask learning is. So um, you have task one and task two, let's say regression and classification. You can learn them at the same time. This might even be useful if you're only interested in one of the two tasks. This might sound weird. So you make it more complicated for the model, and this is exactly the idea behind this. Um, Let's say you're only interested in this here. Let's say classification. And then you, have, you add a regression task to it um, that you're really not interested in, but it would be easy for the model. Well, not easy. It would be easy to implement, and you do have the data. You, have, you do have the labels for it. So you can train those two at the same time, and you probably most likely will find out that if you use this multitask approach, your model will learn better results. And that is simply because you make it harder for the model to do the right thing, because you add an additional task, right? Instead of having a model that identifies cats and dogs, you could ask the model to estimate how much grass there is in the picture. It's completely unrelated to the thing that you're interested in, but it makes it harder for the model to learn the task properly, okay? And by making it harder, you, you force the model to l extract more useful information from the backbone. That's the idea behind this. So you extract more useful information, richer representations, we call them sometimes. We extract those richer representations from the backbone, and based on those, it is easier, or you get a better performance on your tasks, okay? Um, how do you train those models? Before we had one task, one loss. Based on this loss, we um, calculated the gradients and we updated our model, right? It's just the same. We have a loss for our first task and we have a loss for our second task. And the loss of the entire architecture is then just the sum of the two, right? You have two losses. And the loss of your entire architecture is simply the sum of those two losses. It's a pretty easy approach. Um, right, in many cases you would weight the sum here appropriately, whatever that may mean, right? Um, you can simply add the two losses or you, um, typically what you do is you, there's a factor or a coefficient for each of the, the tasks that you're interested in, and that is, ranges somewhere from zero to one, so that the sum of all the coefficients is one. Um, that takes a little bit of time, and there's special methods to figure out what the good weighting is. So why do you need the weighting? Well, to train your model to fi uh, find cats and dogs, this might be easy, trying to figure out how much grass there is in the image, that might be harder. So this is an easy task, this is a hard task. So the loss on the hard task will be much higher, most likely, than on the easy task, right? And therefore, you want to balance kind of the difficulty of the different tasks by balancing 
uh, or awaiting the, the, the losses. That's it. Um, let me show you how to implement it. Because it's really easy. Here we go. Um, so here, we go full in and we build a multitask learning approach that performs multi-class classification on climate zone. So that's what we did before. Um, segmentation on land use, land cover maps, and regression on the seasonal encoding. So that's that number between zero and one, zero for winter. That's whenever the image was taken or the, the data were taken, zero for winter, one for summer. So we do those three things at the same time. And the changes are mainly in the architecture, right? So we have to build our multi-class, um, or we build different heads, one for classification, one for segmentation, one for regression. So for classification, um, it's just a convolution, and then linear layer for segmentation, it's really just a convolution, and for regression, uh, very similar to the classification, convolution, and then linear layer with a single output. And then we combine everything in this multitask unit. So remember, they all share the same backbone. That's the important thing here. So we have our single backbone here. Then we have the different heads. And then in the forward function, we send our input through the backbone. And then the representation from the backbone, we send it through the different uh, heads. And that's it, right? So this is the architecture. Now the trainer, um, there's some more stuff we have to change here. So first of all, we have different criteria, right? Criterion is simply the loss function. We have a loss function for segmentation, classification, and regression. We have the same optimizer. We have the same scheduler. We have different metrics here. We use a Jakar for segmentation, um, accuracy for classification, mean absolute error for regression, for training and validation. Now, the most important changes here, we have the loss function, segmentation, classification, regression. And we have a method that um, weights the losses based on some parameter that we define here in the constructor. Here, loss weights. Those are the weights for the different losses. And is it here? No. Right, so we apply those weights here to the different losses. 0, 1, and 2. And then here we have the different targets, climate zones, season, and the land cover, land use, land cover maps. The input data, that's just Sentinel-2 in this case here, so we don't use data fusion here. Um, we do the forward pass. We calculate the metrics. We calculate the losses. We weight the losses. And um, the training loss is then returned here. And it works the exact same way as before, right? The only thing we had to change here is to change the architecture so that we have the three different heads. And then the trainer so that we ha can have the three different loss functions. And we combine them in a weighted way to a single loss. Because the optimizer expects a single loss value to operate on. So it's, it's really straightforward. Um, here we define our model. Uh, we have the different criterions or criteria. Here, cross entropy loss for classification and segmentation. And then MSE for the regression. And one detail here, we're not going to do the full weighting of the losses. We simply weight them one, one, one. Right? So they all have the same weight. <clears throat> and that's it. Right? Same as before. Architectural changes, and then um, changing the trainers so that the three losses are combined into a single loss. If we run it, I'm going to skip that. Um, 
Here we can plot some results from the training. So we have the losses for classification, segmentation, and regression. They all go down, that's very nice. And same for the metrics. We have accuracy for classification. Um, the IOU for validation here, same. Um, the validation data set actually performs a little bit better. Um, even here, that's weird. But it can happen. So it, it does the right thing. Here's an example um, what you, um, get rid of this. So this is the ground truth. This is our prediction from the model. Here's the segmentation map, climate zone, and season. So the season is, is a little bit off the climate zone. It found that was easy. And then here for the segmentation map, you see that conceptually it, it finds the different shapes, but it assigns the wrong classes to it. So to give you a better picture um, of what this is capable of, let's download a pre-trained model. So a model, the same model that was trained on a much larger part of our data set. And I will show or talk about this in a second. So this is this oh, test index. This is something I didn't run. Sorry about that. Okay, that's a different example or a different sample. But anyway, what you see, so this is the prediction on the model trained on the much larger data set. Um, here, you see that the background or it found the right classes, it conceptually got the right areas. So here's actually, there's quite a bit of detail in here. So it, it can learn the right thing, right? We have the right climate zone and season is okay. Right. So. If you give it enough data, it can actually learn something useful. That's what I, what I want to show you here. And especially we found that uh, segmentation tasks are pretty good in combination with classification or regression because they cover a wide range of, of different things and different features. And um, of course, segmentation is more focused or interested in the fine little details, whereas classification just looks at the entire image um, so forcing those two to work together and extract useful representations is, is pretty good so that the model learns the right thing. Okay, questions on multitask learning. If there is no questions, we have 10 minutes left. We can get this done. Okay, then I'll simply move on. Uh, ah, yeah, some examples from our own research. Let me skim this real quick. So what we did is we, we tried to estimate or predict for power plants how much power they produce at the time when they were observed and how much CO2 they're outputting. So we took Sentinel-2 data, a unit, and set it up as a regression task, how much power is being produced at the time of observation. We get some ground truth from the ENSO database for this. And it kind of works. I mean, the A MAE, the absolute error, is 202 megawatts. So that's basically the size of a large, large-ish power plant to tell us whether it's on or not. Um, R square is OK. And then we set this up as a multitask approach where we combine the regression with a classification of what type of power plant is this and a segmentation that gives us the exact outline of the, the plume. So basically the network focuses on the plume to get some information on whether there is um, or how much power is being produced. And you see that with this approach, the 
MAE already drops a little bit. Not too much, but it drops a little bit. Um, here are some qualitative examples, just looking at the segmentation task. And you see here, single task, baseline is okay. Multitask helps a little bit to have more information. We also have one additional approach here where we use some, some physics uh, in this. So we added information on the uh, environmental conditions at the time of observation and also some physical constraints on what is feasible and that makes it a little bit better. So you can combine those approaches with each other. You could also, I mean, this is data fusion plus multitask learning plus physics. It's, it's like Lego. You put everything together and then see whether it works or not. Okay, final part. Transfer learning and self-supervised learning. So probably we will stay on a high level here um, just for the sake of time. So transfer learning, we already talked about this. You're interested in this thing here, input. This is your input data, some task. What you can do is you can um, pre-train your task on a different data set and or um, you can pre-train your model, sorry, on a different data set on a different task and then take the trained model here, use it as a pre-trained model here and simply continue learning, continue training. And it's super easy. Um, let me show you real quick in the code. Because this is exactly what we just did. You just, you just load a checkpoint of a trained model, and then you load that into your model. This is how you load a model, so all the code is there. And then you simply, this is what we did before. You define all the things that you want. You define the, um, you need a trainer and everything. And then you can simply continue training. So this is really simple, right? Not much to do there. And so, Transfer learning is great, and there's a lot of models out there that are pre-trained on something. In many cases, unfortunately, it's only ImageNet, but that might still be useful for some applications because the model has already learned to see, right? This is the idea behind this. It, the model learns the basic from, basics from somewhere else, and then you can kind of leverage that in the fine-tuning process. This is what this is called here, where you fine-tune your model on your specific data set. So one big question, because we're, labels are scarce, labels are expensive, can we use unlabeled data for this pre-training here? And there is self-supervised learning, and self-supervised self learning is exactly that. It solves this here by using pseudo-labels derived from the, um, uh, the data. So to, to kind of visualize you the idea behind self-supervised learning and transfer learning, I love to use this picture of my son, Paul, when he was one year old. He was sitting in the living room every evening and he was looking through books. He had no clue what he was looking at, right? And he didn't want us to be there. He was, we were reading books to him all the time, but every once in a while he just sat there and he was browsing books. And I was wondering, why the hell is he doing that? And at some point it popped. He's doing self-supervised learning. He learns about shapes. He learns about colors just by looking at them. His brain is able to get that information. Okay, there's different shapes. There's different colors. There's this, there's that, there's that. Oh, this occurs pretty often with that. Oh, that's interesting. Without thinking about it, right? It's, it's all, un maybe not unconscious, but, but he, doesn't, he has no agenda, really. So he learns to see, to differentiate between different image features without any supervision. This is self-supervised learning. And then what comes after self-supervised learning, once your model is pre-trained, you do transfer learning. So this is the same guy. Two years later, he still sits in his room, and he's looking through books. And now he's like, what is this? And I tell him, it's a cat. OK, it's a cat. So he uses the pre-trained features. He learned about the features, what, what, what makes up a cat. And you 
you need very few labels to tell him, very few examples, this is a cat, this is a dog or something, and he knows, he, and he can generalize to other pictures. And this is exactly what this is, self-supervised learning and transfer learning. Sometimes you would refer to this case here even as few shot learning. You give him a few examples, and then he can learn something new. So, one, I think we're running late, are we? Four minutes, okay, I can do that. Contrastive self-supervised learning. So this is one approach to self-supervised learning. And the idea here is simply, you have one example, you give it to your backbone, it creates a representation and you can project that into a so-called n-dimensional latent space, something mathematically complex, and it shows, somewhere, shows up somewhere as a little dot. You have a different area, you run it through the same backbone, you get a representation, it shows up somewhere else. Okay? The idea is now that if those two observations are different, dissimilar, they should repel each other and show up in different areas of that latent space. Oops. Um, if you have the same area, they should be very close to each other or very similar areas. And this is exactly what uh, self-supervised learning or contrastive self-supervised learning is. It comes from computer vision. This is the architecture that we use here. It's called SimClear. Here they use one picture and then uh, they apply different transformations. And if they know that it's the same picture, they should coalesce in uh, latent space. But if those are different pictures, then they should repel each other. And this is basically the supervision. It's like a pseudo label that they use for, that you can use for supervision to train your model, to pre-train your model. And so we implemented this. I will skip the code because you, it's, it's kind of complex, but could you have a, please have a look at it. We used it here. This is a paper from last year where we used this approach with two different encoders, and instead of using two different views of the same image or different images, we use Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data for the same location, and those are always the same locations. So the idea is now that if you have this image, you feed it to the um, Sentinel-1 encoder, and you have that image feed it to the Sentinel-2 encoder, they should repel each other because it's different locations. But if it's the same location, they should attract each other. Right, so you can use that again as a supervision signal. It's very similar to the SimClear architecture before, but it's augmentation-free and uh, contrastive. Why did, did we do that? Let me show you this. This is, I promise, the last slide. Um, here you have the average accuracy for training or fine-tuning this pre-trained model on the DFC 2020 data set. So it's a higher resolution uh, land use land cover data set. Um, this is the average accuracy for different modeling approaches. Those are early and late fusion, kind of basic models. These are two approaches that use uh, self-supervised pre-training. And here we have the label fraction. So from this DFC 2020 data set, we use 100% of the data to train the model on, 50%, 10%, and so on. So what is important here? The important thing is that if you have a fully supervised approach, the best you can get is like 62% accuracy. Okay, if you use 100% of, of the data set for training. Now, you see that, um, let's only focus on the orange model because that's more successful. At 10% of the label data, if you have a model that is pre-trained in a self-supervised way and you use only 10% of the label data to train your pre-trained model on those 10%, you see that it's uh, already above the baseline that you can get with 100% of the data. So in turn, this means that you need only 10% of the training data if you pre-train your model with this technique. So you can save 90% of the labels, or you can 
you can, you can train as if you were using a 10 times larger data set. So that's why self-supervised learning, transfer learning, they're important because they allow you to um, train very efficiently. So this is like, this is what we're researching right now to make this even more efficient and to, to, to bring like this efficiency topic to, um, to a new level. And this is it. So we talked about data augmentations, data fusion, multitask learning, transfer learning, self-supervised learning. The code that is available online, also have a look at the, if you're interested, at the tutorial we gave at iGARS. There's some more examples along the same lines. Feel free to use that in your, for your own research. That's the idea of why I provided that. Give it a try, um, take your data sets, tune them a little bit, and apply these methods here in this code to your data sets, and then uh, hopefully you will get better results. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Non c'è bisogno di registrare questa cosa. Ah, okay. Some, uh, info some communications. Okay, one thing is to put the pictures that 